Hello, I'm Michael Lemley, executive producer and director of this series that you're going to be learning about today in this video, Monuments, Memorials, and Museums, a project that is integrating technology into education, and I'm joined here with... Hi, my name's Caroline Nice. I'm, I am one of the editors and writers of this project. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Hell, and I'm a writer and an editor for this project. Hi, I'm Victoria Alexander, and I'm a writer and editor for this project. So how did we start this project? How did this project come about? Our teacher had thought of the idea because she wanted to do something different that no one else had done before. So she was she got the idea of monuments, memorials, or museums. We decided, you know, let's make something for ourselves. Let's use uh, technology and really infuse it into education and kind of make this whole project. So I mean, how did we start writing this project? I know for me, when I chose the Thomas Jefferson one, I, I liked it because of its location. It is set on the tidal basin and during certain months there's cherry trees that bloom and it oh, it's stunning and so I really wanted to do that one. Because the whole writing process itself it took you know, some time and then eventually once it was all done, I remember we all kind of gathered in a circle, kind of like this one, and we kind of peer edited each other's papers. And then we actually started production on April 9th, 2013. Uh, it was really nerve wracking. I was excited, but I was really nervous. It was crazy though, because um, all the people were all around us asking us questions, like if we were reporters or something. And it was fun to have that experience. Michael also, he, we had maybe like an hour footage for each of us, and how long did each of us turn out? Maybe like uh, five minutes? Five or seven minutes, yeah. So he went through like the hours of video and he condensed it down to five minutes. That's some talent right there. Yeah, Good I mean, job, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> so getting back to the kind of filming aspect of it, we each went up on a certain day and kind of filmed each person's monument, and we got um, also footage of it. Um, and we did it in a really professional way. Edited it down into a four to five minute video, um, as you can see on YouTube. Something that strikes me is when we're actually on, we had an overnight shoot, and we filmed at night, we filmed at the Jefferson Memorial, late at night, at 11 o'clock at night, all of the girls were tired and in the car. We got footage of the Jefferson Memorial at night, and that was one of the best experiences I can say I've ever had, and it was just amazing. The shot that you went, you went like all the way up the, um, the statue in the center of the, uh, monument. It was just, it was phenomenal. It's an iconic shot. You guys kind of really learned technology in a way that maybe you couldn't have um, in a traditional sense, but you kind of got it all together and then kind of grew to be like an awesome group. Because you guys were awesome when, you were up in, when we were up in DC. I think they're like us growing as a group. It, it's kind of bonded us and you can see it through our videos how tight we are and how we work together well and we all understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. We had fun at night, we had fun making mistakes and kind of just growing as friends. One of the memories I had was with all of you guys and we were at the World War II Memorial at night and you guys were just kind of goofing off. And I got it on tape, which is really funny, um, but that was one of the hilarious parts for me. We recently won a grant for our project for $2,000 from ING um, for $2,000, part of their Unsung Heroes project. And once we got the check, we had to decide how to spend the money. And Victoria, how did we decide what we wanted to spend it on? Well, we really wanted something that we could really use a lot, and one of the things we really needed was a teleprompter, and it really helped us um, not have to memorize and just keep going on with our filming. I think what helped us decide what we needed is we just identified what wasn't helping us at all. Like, we had to carry it, all these this stuff around D.C., and it was just so annoying, and none of us wanted to hold it, so we got this huge case. Like, you probably could store a body in it. It's really big. <laughs> so it really did not take long for us to figure out what we wanted to spend money on. Yeah. The decision-making process was really influenced by the fact that we all kind of really grew together as friends. I mean, I got to know Caroline a lot better, and Elizabeth a lot better, and Victoria a lot better over the course of the year. And you guys kind of became, like, my, my circle, my inner circle of, like, filmmaking buddies and stuff. So, I mean, like, you guys are now, like, my best friends. And so, like, through the decision-making process, I mean, it really made the process a whole lot easier. I think, like, half the time, in the 30 minutes we put all together for you to edit down, half the time was bloopers. Half. Do y'all remember the line? I can't remember that. Uh, it's my hair in the way. Yeah, I remember one time my teacher was talking and I was like, Dr. Lindsay, <laughs> you messed up my shot. <laughs> And then also Michael, he was just getting really frustrated because he could not talk right. I could not. He was just messing up his lines. He's like, can I get a teleprompter? <laughs> not knowing that we would now have a teleprompter. <laughs> I remember Carolyn, there's this group of tourists that came up and started taking pictures of you and you got super freaked out. You're like, go away, go away. <laughs> you wouldn't even let me be there, so let alone a bunch of tourists be there. You're like, no. <laughs> 
It was really funny because from the outside I was staying there. I was like dating pictures. Oh, Caroline's famous. You we did were it, famous. Caroline. <laughs> I mean, we really were. I mean, me and Elizabeth, we were up there once at the Jarvis Memorial. We had someone come up to us and be like, "Are you guys from the news? Do you?" Do you produce for the news? We're like, no, we're, we're from Williamsburg, Virginia. We're, we're producing <laughs> videos. We're students. We, we're, we're not from the news or anything. So I thought that was really interesting. And I really liked that part. So how did you select the soundtrack for our videos? Well, the soundtrack for the videos in and of itself, um, I'm a big fan of music in general. I love music um, and like soundtrack in particular. And I just like kind of like the feel that kind of like went with the video, what, what went, actually went with the soundtrack to these videos. I remember we were like, we were just watching one of the rough drafts of Elizabeth's video, and we were trying to figure out what music he had added into it. We we're like, Michael, is that Taylor Swift? <laughs> it, it was a Taylor Swift song. It was Taylor Swift's Begin Again, and the piano guys did a cover on that song, and I thought it was really pretty, not knowing it was Taylor Swift at the time, but then I'm like, oh, so I decided to put it in. The whole way that we did the soundtrack really just en en encapsulated kind of everything that we wanted to for our viewers to feel during the, um, the videos. So how do you think y'all have grown? Like, what have your strengths and weaknesses? How have they, they changed? I think now you've done a lot better with the other videos. We also have like more confidence now in not caring about messing up, just kind of like going with the flow. And I remember like, I, I didn't like to interview people beforehand. And so now through these projects and through this one, stepping in front of the camera, I've gotten a lot more comfortable. Have you improved anyway? Because you were used to be like behind the camera, but now we just kind of like stuck you in front of it. I know, right? I mean, I, I, at first, when we first started out this project, I had no idea what I was going to do, honestly. For these videos, I was super nervous about producing them. I thought they were going to turn out awful, but they didn't. They turned out like really nice. Um, and I grew my self confidence as an editor to kind of say, wow, I can produce these kinds of products. I remember what was also unique was that our teacher would tweet about us the whole entire time. <laughs> Literally every intimate detail that happened. The more and more that people heard about our project, the more the word got around, and it's still going around, which is neat. Twitter was a huge part in this project. I think it still is. It still is. Um, we actually have a Twitter account at Monument. Mon Mem Mus, which is kind of weird, but Monuments, Memorials, and Museums is kind of what it stands for. Another neat thing that we got to experience was we wanted to add on to this project and come again and do it this year like we did last year, but better. Together, I'm just so grateful that you guys kind of came along and just kind of joined part, as a part of this project and kind of that I got to know you guys each a lot better. You guys, you guys are awesome people um, and really just helped bring this project to the next level and bring it to a reality. The Jefferson Memorial is a circular colonnade structure surrounded by 26 columns and covering a 19-foot statue of Thomas Jefferson. On December 15, 1938, John Russell Pope began designing plans for the memorial. He modeled this memorial after the Roman Pantheon in Italy and the famous rotunda at the University of Virginia, the same university Jefferson happened to found. Now you might not know who Pope was, but you might know of some other projects he had designed, such as the Vanderbilt House in Asheville, North Carolina, the Natural History Museum in New York City, or maybe the Natural Gallery of Art here in Washington, D.C. Finally, after months of planning, on November 15, 1939, President Roosevelt laid the cornerstone for the memorial. Now that the structure by architect Pope had started construction, a contest was held for the designer of the sculpture to go inside. Rudolph Evans was the lucky winner of this contest. Due to World War II, there was a restriction on metals, so Evans had to compensate by making a temporary plaster model painted bronze for the opening of the memorial but later he replaced it with a 19-foot sculpture of Jefferson and even included some elements that reflected his passions. Examples include a column to represent his passion for architecture, corn stalks to represent his history in farming, and his finest work, the Declaration of Independence, clutched in his right hand. Inside the memorial, Jefferson faces the west side of the mall. The panel located on his left side has quotes from his book, A Bill for Establishing Religious Freedom. On the right side of him are more quotes and pieces of his writings. On the left side, across from the corn stalks, located on the back of the statue, is a famous quote from the Declaration of Independence. Across from the column on the back side of the statue are quotes from colleagues and close business friends that Jefferson sent letters to. In its entirety, the monument rests on 2.5 acres of land and stands 129 feet tall. Surrounding the structure are Japanese cherry trees that can be seen in full, full bloom during the month of April. In one year, 800,000 people come to see this memorial. It's a popular destination stop for many people along the cherry tree walkway located next to the tidal basin.
Williamsburg Christian Academy welcomes you to the Korean War Memorial. We are here today to examine a memorial that starts as the result of an internal civil war between North Korea and South Korea. On the side of North Korea is Communist China. On the side of South Korea is the USA. This war is one that is fought and ultimately ends at the 38th parallel. The Korean War actually begins with an act of aggression by North Korea towards South Korea. North Korea invades its democratic South Korean counterpart in an attempt to try to unify the country. The United Nations later gets involved in what ultimately becomes a war, a civil war, that is a stalemate. North and South Korea land on the 38th parallel which becomes to today the stalemate line that divides North and South Korea. This line plays a key role in the monument and memorial you are about to see. Congress authorized the construction of the Korean War Memorial in 1986. The initial design for this memorial was conceived by the University of Pennsylvania and its team of architects. Later, because of discrepancies around the actual memorial, a new firm came in and took the memorial to its next uh, location. The memorial is laid out in three parts. It is a triangle and a circle. The triangle will include a platoon of soldiers marching across what appears to be the land of Korea. On one side you will see a long black granite wall with etchings that simulate some of the feelings and the experiences of the soldiers of the time. There is an open side to the triangle, that third side, and we will see the wall that honors the 22 countries from the United Nations that supported with men and women this emphasis of democracy. The last part of this monument deals with a reflecting pool, and there we'll see information about those who were killed those who were injured, and those who were prisoners of war. The base of the triangle is the beginning of a platoon on its way toward a battle site. 38 soldiers that you will see marching across this field represent the 38th parallel. You will see, as you look at this titanous monument, soldiers that are larger than life and each one weighs approximately a thousand pounds. The struggle, the humanity, and the emphasis on each face is so that you, the person who observes this memorial, gets to understand the paramount importance this civil war ultimately plays on the landscape of the 21st century. On one side of the triangle is a large black granite wall. In it are the faces, and the landscape of Korea. 19 soldiers who are in the platoon are reflected in the black wall, giving us again the number 38. At the reflecting pool area, we'd also like to call to your attention the commemorative plaque inscribed as follows. Our nation honors her sons and daughters who answered the call to defend a country they never knew and a people they never met. Don't forget to return by night to see the haunting faces of these brave soldiers as they walk across the Korean terrain. Look into their eyes, get a sense of what they faced, and know that these men fought for you. And remember, freedom is not free.
Lincoln Memorial. This memorial is built in memory of the 16th President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. It rests on 107 acres of land along the banks of the Potomac River, and it took seven years to complete. Henry Bacon drew the design of this grand memorial based on a plan similar to the Parthenon in Athens, Greece. The building is 204 feet long, 134 feet wide, 99 feet tall, and each of the 36 columns surrounding the memorial is 44 feet tall. The columns represent the states in the Union at the time of Lincoln's death. Individual state names are listed above the columns and Hawaii and Alaska are listed on a separate plaque. The building contains a large seated sculpture of Abraham Lincoln. This sculpture was designed by Daniel Chester French and was carved by the Piccarelli brothers. The sculpture is made of 28 Georgia white marble blocks and alone weighs 175 tons and cost $88,400. The entire memorial is composed of marble from Colorado and Tennessee and limestone from Indiana. On the ceiling are two Two paintings by Jules Guerin, one entitled Reunion and Progress, the other Emancipation of a Race. 87 steps descend into the reflecting pool from the memorial. This number is symbolic of the line four score and seven years ago in Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which is engraved on the south wall of the Lincoln Memorial to the right-hand side of Lincoln's statue. On the north wall, on the left-hand side of Lincoln's statue, is engraved his second inaugural address. It took an entire year to carve all the inscriptions, including the one behind the head of the statue, saying, in this temple, as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the Union, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. Abraham Lincoln affected the lives of many people around the country, and this memorial is built to honor his life and the impact he had on America 150 years ago. Eight years after the Vietnam War, the Vietnam Veterans Wall was dedicated in memory of those who gave their lives. However, this memorial did not bring peace. In fact, it brought additional controversy and division to the United States. Jane Scruggs, the president of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, founded the wall. The VVMF raised nearly $9 million in private donations. The entire memorial contains three contributions the wall, the three servicemen statue and flagpole, and the Vietnam Women's Memorial. When the wall was completed in November of 1982, the popular opinion was that it was death-centered. As a compromise, the three servicemen statue and flagpole was unveiled in the summer of 1984. Its purpose was to highlight the patriotism of those involved in battle. Another opinion emerged that women were not represented properly for their service. So in 1993, the Vietnam Women's Memorial was dedicated. Four main objectives were required for the wall. The appearance had a spark emotion, the setting had harmonized with the structure, the neutrality about the war was essential, and the honor roll must be included. Maya Lin, the architect, desired a safe place for the mourners to show reverence, remembrance, and respect. Ms. Lin wanted the harmony of nature and the memorial to complement one another. Instead of placing the names in alphabetical order, the deceased were arranged chronologically. If they were situated otherwise, the architect said they would be lost in a pool of smiths. Chronological order shows how our veterans changed history. However, the final product did not come without international or national criticism. Numerous people were offended that a Chinese American was the architect of a memorial from an Asian war. Also, critics felt that Ms. Lin's simple idea looked like a big black scar on the earth. Tension was so profound that the architect's name wasn't even mentioned at the dedication of the memorial. The wall is composed of two 246 foot long horizontal slabs that gradually emerge from the ground forming a V. The slabs meet at an angle of 125 degrees. The vertex of the wall is just over 10 feet tall. The walls are fashioned from black granite from India. A computerized type setting process called Optima was created in Texas just for the memorial. As of Memorial Day 2011, an array of 58,272 names represent those killed in Vietnam. Tension and dispute continued in America after the war because the wall did not properly represent valor but was rather focused on death. As a compromise between the various points of view, the three servicemen's statue and a flagpole was erected. These additions contribute heroism, patriotism, and honor to the memorial. Frederick Hart sculpted the three servicemen's statue consisting of 
three eight-foot-tall young men dressed in uniform. They represent the various military branches as well as the diversity of the Americans who fought in the war. Vulnerability and loneliness in their facial expressions show the true sacrifice of a soldier. For the first time in United States history, a memorial acclaiming women was constructed. The Vietnam Women's Memorial was dedicated to over 265,000 valiant women who volunteered. The majority of the women served the country as nurses, with eight of their names appearing on the wall. Glenna Goodacre, the sculptor of the statue, included three nurses serving their fallen brother. One woman is standing up, watchful for danger, while another is tending to the fallen man's needs, and another is in a praying position with his helmet on her knee. They have no pedestal to show that women were always on the ground tending to others' needs. The statue stands six feet, eight inches tall, and weighs one ton. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial is the most popular memorial in Washington, D.C., viewed by about 3.5 million visitors a year. Through all the pain and controversy, this memorial pushed through and became the great attraction it is today. Whether first or last, old or young, these names are precious to us and should always be remembered. Welcome to the Washington Monument. Plans for a national monument dedicated to George Washington started in 1783 when Congress proposed that a statue of George Washington on a horse be constructed in the Capitol building. This project failed due to the lack of funding, but in 1836, John Marshall, James Madison, and others formed the Washington National Monument Society. The society advertised for architectural designs to decide what the monument would look like. The winning architect was Robert Mills, whose design called for a flat-topped obelisk. On the 4th of July in 1848, the cornerstone was laid for the monument. Attending the ceremony was then Representative Abraham Lincoln, as well as President James K. Polk. Later in 1854, the threat of a looming civil war stopped construction on the monument. During the hiatus between construction, the grounds surrounding the monument were used as a pasture for cattle, and the inside of the monument was used as a slaughterhouse. After the conclusion of the Civil War, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was commissioned to finish the monument. Due to the time that had passed, the same color stones that had originally been used were not available. So at the 150-foot level, you can see a change in the color of the monument. This is where construction stopped and then later resumed after the Civil War. The capstone was placed on the monument on February 21st, 1885. On October 9th, 1888, the Washington Monument was open to the public. The Washington Monument weighs 81,120 tons and stands 555 and 1 8 inch tall. The monument contains 36,491 stones. Total cost to build the monument was $1,187,710. On top of the Washington Monument is a 3,300 pound capstone that serves as a lightning rod. Inscribed on the first three faces is information about the monument, such as when the cornerstone was laid and information about the designer. Inscribed on the fourth face is the Latin phrase, laus Dio, which means praise be to God. At the time of filming, the Washington Monument is currently under construction due to an earthquake that hit in August 2011 that damaged stones on the monument. The National Park Service hopes that the monument will be open again in 2014. The Washington Monument is the world's tallest stone structure and the tallest structure in Washington, D.C., and by law, no structure can be taller in the city. Welcome to the World War II Memorial. The World War II Memorial pays eternal tribute to the millions of Americans who sacrificed their lives. The memorial opened to the public on April 29, 2004 and was dedicated by George W. Bush on Memorial Day weekend. The memorial is artfully constructed of granite and bronze and forms the shape of an oval. This memorial encompasses 7.4 acres of land. At the entrance of the memorial, there are marble flagpoles flying the American flag with seals of the military branches on their bases. Walking through the entrance on either side, visitors progress through a series of 24 bronze relief panels depicting experiences from the war. These 17 foot tall pillars creatively celebrate the unprecedented unity of our nation during the Second World War 
and are inscribed with the names of the 48 states and territories of 1945 and the District of Columbia. Continuing to the west side of the memorial, visitors will find a nine-foot wall of gold stars with the message, here we mark the price of freedom. Thoughtfully named the Freedom Wall, each of the 4,048 stars represent 100 American soldiers who died during the war. After thoughtful reflection at the wall of stars, visitors can enter the circle of remembrance and sit peacefully and enjoy the tranquility of the large pool and beautiful fountains. The World War II generation is considered America's greatest generation, and now their memory is preserved within the physical walls of this exquisite memorial. The World War II memorial is located between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument and is open 24 hours a day. Over 4.5 million people have visited the memorial each year paying respect to the World War II veterans.